Hi everyone, I'm Harvey Mason Jr., Interim President and CEO and Chair of the Recording Academy. And I'd like to welcome you to our 23rd Annual Entertainment Law Initiative event. First, I'd like to thank the Luca Mendoza Trio for getting us started with your music. We're so glad you could join us today to celebrate this year's ELI Service Award winner, to recognize three students who are prize winners in this year's writing competition, and enjoy a roundtable discussion on the crucial importance of diversity in our industry. One silver lining of this year's virtual event format is that it allows many more law students to join us today from all across the country. And I'd like to especially welcome you and thank you for joining us. The pandemic related challenges our music community has faced this past year have provided important opportunities for the Recording Academy to do what we do best, use our resources to help. When the crisis struck last spring, the Recording Academy and our members sprang into action to ensure that federal aid and assistance reached the vulnerable music makers and music businesses forced to navigate the uncertainty of the months ahead. Our planned advocacy agenda was paused as our efforts shifted to focus on pressing new matters like unemployment and saving performance venues. And our planned gatherings in districts across the country and on Capitol Hill went virtual. When the CARES Act passed last March, we were successful in securing key provisions for music makers and businesses, including expanded unemployment for gig workers and dedicated loans for the smallest of small businesses. The Academy quickly established a hotline to help individuals navigate these new programs, and our members immediately urged Congress for more. Our first ever Virtual District Advocate Day saw nearly 2,000 Academy members send thousands of letters and conduct hundreds of meetings with lawmakers asking for more and better aid. This major push continued into the fall until Congress passed the second largest relief bill in American history. This time with dedicated funding for music venues, better unemployment aid for gig workers, and more business saving loans for underserved small businesses. Our members also never stopped fighting for better and improved copyright protections and creators' rights. And today, the CASE Act is the law of the land. The MLC is up and running, and Congress is working towards reforming the DMCA. 
Finally, we're proud and thankful that Music Harris has been able to distribute over $22 million to over 25,000 individual music professionals to help them through the unprecedented interruption of their regular livelihoods. Many of you have helped steer donations our way that fueled this effort, and for that, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Turning to ELI, I'm so pleased to have seen the growth and success of this initiative over the years. It really has become a great meeting point for the business side of our industry, and it really kicks off our Grammy weekend. While we can't all be together in person, we're still thrilled to have you join us today, and we hope you'll also join us during the culmination of this year's celebration of music during the 63rd Grammy Awards on CBS Sunday. I'd like to personally thank the many law firms and music companies listed in today's program who've contributed support to keep this program alive and thriving through the years. And for the strong support you've shown for this 2021 virtual edition, I'd like to express my special appreciation. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the esteemed members of the music law community who compose our ELI Executive Committee. Your service is much appreciated and it gives me great pleasure to introduce this year's chair of that committee, Lori Soriano, who in addition to serving as our chair of this group, is a partner at the law firm of King, Holmes, Paterno, and Soriano LLP here in Los Angeles. Lori, welcome. Thanks, Harvey. I'm so pleased to be here with everyone to keep the Recording Academy's Entertainment Law Initiative alive in this year of challenges that have affected the entire world and so many in our music community. I hope you are all staying safe. I too am already missing saying hello to friends and colleagues at the pre-reception, but it was still so nice to hear the music at the top of the program. Thanks to the Luca Mendoza Trio for this musical moment. And I thank you all for joining us and keeping up our annual tradition of recognizing some leaders in the field of music law, along with some accomplished law students at this event during Grammy week. I first want to acknowledge all the members of the executive committee of ELI. Their names are displayed in the digital program, and I thank them for all their work in developing and supporting the initiative. This event, the 23rd annual edition of ELI, marks the first time that the ELI Service Award has been given to an organization rather than an individual. On behalf of our entire executive committee, I want to offer our congratulations to all the members of the Black Entertainment and Sports Lawyers Association as we honor them in our program later today. Beesla has done a lot of tremendously meaningful work in its 40 year history. It's time for the entire music industry to acknowledge the incredibly important role that black creators and executives have played in bringing the world's music industry and musical tradition to where they are today. Honoring this organization is particularly meaningful to me since one of the key goals I have set for myself in my term as chair and I know the entire committee joins me in this regard, is to help bring more diversity to our ELI leadership, our writing competition outreach, and the industry generally moving forward, and more broadly to rectify the many terrible injustices suffered by the Black sector of our industry. Helping to fuel ELI each year is the generous support of many law firms and companies many who have supported the effort for multiple years and continue to do so in this difficult year. Please take note of these firms and companies which are listed in your digital program and slides shown during the event. I'd like to spotlight two of our most significant supporters this year. The first is Fox Rothschild LLP, who have been supporters of ELI for many years. They are platinum presenting partners this year, and we appreciate their special emphasis on supporting the ELI writing competition scholarships as part of their participation. Secondly, Universal Music Group, who have also been long-term supporters of this event. I'd also like to again acknowledge UMG's Jeff Harliston, who was our 2020 ELI Service Award honoree. An equally important part of our work within the ELI program is to support future careers in entertainment law by giving law students educational and networking opportunities. To that end, I'd like to congratulate this year's law students who are scholarship winners today in our ELI writing competition. I'm also pleased to spotlight that several members of our executive committee will provide mentorship sessions to the winners this year, in addition to the scholarship funds. In a moment, you'll hear more about the competition and these students, 
but I do want to take a moment to thank this year's volunteer attorney graders who, along with our ELI Writing Competition Program Chair, Ken Abdo, gave their time to grade this year's writing competition entries. So here to tell you more about this year's competition and to further recognize these students is my colleague on the executive committee, Ken Abdo. Thank you, Lori. Like Lori, let's thank other sponsors who made today's program possible. First is First Horizon Iberia Bank, a platinum supporter. Second is Spotify, another platinum supporter and a return supporter. And finally, Greenberg Trial Ring, which has been a platinum level supporter for many years. On to my favorite part of the program, which is recognizing our scholars, our writers, our winners. First off, I'll give you some background. Many of you already know this, but let's just review what this competition is about. The students are asked to identify, research, and write an essay with a proposed solution on a compelling legal issue confronting the music industry. Each one of these winners gets a prize. The grand prize or the winning prize is a $10,000 scholarship along with mentorship session. The runner-ups, $2,500 each along with a mentorship session. In order to get to this spot, we have to go through a ladder of graders, a process which has to be done very expeditiously given the short period of time uh, between the submission of the papers and the declaration of the winners. 40 volunteers have assisted. All papers get graded at least twice. No one knows who wrote the papers or where they came from, completely anonymous. And through that process, through these 40 graders who volunteer their times and who are all uh, very competent music lawyers themselves, uh, we come to the winners. So thank you to all of our graders. And now we're gonna learn something about our contestants, our authors, our winners. They've each submitted a video and it's gonna let us know a little bit more about them, about their background and what brought them to this day. Hi, I'm Evan Beagle and I'm from New York where I study at St. John's University School of Law. Hello, I'm Sophia Soferman. I'm pursuing my LLM degree in entertainment law at the University of Miami. Hi everyone, my name is Alberto Vargas and I'm one at the University of Chicago. Music plays a big role in my life not only because my father's a concert pianist, but because I've been a percussionist for about 15 years. I've always had a passion for music because it speaks a universal language. A little bit about my background. I was born in Elgin, Illinois, right outside the city of Chicago, to Mexican immigrant parents. Some of my earliest and happiest memories of music are when we would get together with my aunts and uncles and sing old songs in Spanish while my uncle played the guitar. Since then, music has been a huge part of my life. I decided to attend law school after studying both physics and math due to my interest in intellectual property and its intersection with new technologies, specifically how new technologies may affect the IP landscapes of various industries, including the entertainment industry. After graduating from Union College, I worked as a news producer, then studied at Pace Law School and became a licensed attorney in New York and New Jersey. I worked in live music production and also toured the country with a renowned rock band, which provided me with a unique viewpoint from the musician's perspective. Afterwards, I practiced civil and criminal litigation at a boutique firm in New York City. I played in bands, orchestras, pits, stage managed, and I studied music education and bilingual education for my undergrad. After that, I taught middle and high school music and DSL for four years um, before I was drawn to law as a result of a mock trial project that I gave to my students. I realized that a career in law would have a lot of the things that I really loved about teaching, but that I would also get to research and write a lot, which I wasn't able to do as much as a teacher. At St. John's, my entertainment law professor guided me towards the writing competition, and I'm grateful for his support and having the opportunity to submit my research. Currently, I'm pursuing my LLM degree in entertainment law at the University of Miami to strengthen my foundation as I aspire to practice music law. I look forward to hopefully combining my passions for music, teaching, and law into a career. I'm truly humbled to introduce myself here. Thanks very much. It is such an honor to be with you all here today. 
Thank you so much for having me at this beautiful event. I'm grateful to God for the opportunity to be addressing this group of people. Now let's meet our runners up, Evan Beagle and Alberto Vargas. Hello, gentlemen, and congratulations. Evan, we're going to start with you. You attend St. John's University School of Law in New York City, and your paper is entitled Turning the Role of Artificial Intelligence in Musical Work Infringement. Congratulations, Evan. Thank you. Well, your paper is about artificial intelligence, of which you have none of because you're a real live thinking human being, but you create a proposition for the protection uh, under copyright for works created with the assistance of artificial intelligence. So let's talk about your inspiration uh, for writing this piece to begin with. Sure, so I listened to a lot of music when I was studying and reading for law school. One day I came upon a new track that sounded super familiar to me and thought, couldn't an AI show me the reference track that I'm thinking of? And I asked my friend who's a software engineer and he said, yeah, of course AI could do that. So that became the focus of my paper for my entertainment law course. And that's where this idea came from. So your inspiration for an article about an essay about music was music. That's very good. So um, I know you talked about artificial intelligence as a way to vet um, parts of, of works to determine if there's infringable elements in there. But do you think that artificial intelligence works created with the assistance of artificial intelligence will ultimately be protectable under copyright in and of themselves? Maybe one day in the more far term, but more in the near term, AI could and probably will be used to ascertain whether or not there's similarities and in what aspects two works are similar to help ascertain such similarities between a plaintiff's and defendant's work. Very good. Well, thank you and congratulations. We're going to move over to Alberto at this time. Hello, Alberto. You attend the uh, law school at the University of Chicago, and your paper is entitled Bare Possibility or Reasonable Opportunity in Defense of a Defendant Conscious View of Access in a Digital Age, which is to say that in the digital age, there is so much access to works through so many different means that access itself as an element of copyright infringement is becoming diluted more easier to, to, to meet uh, in, in the otherwise evolving. So let's talk about your uh, epiphany that drew you to writing this article. What happened? Sure, so I think there are two big things that led me to this. I think first is just my interest in how legal concepts change with new technologies. And then the second one is just thinking through um, if we're gonna make this, this big change to such a central part of copyright, um, where we can establish access by a trivial showing that a work is available on demand. It's just going to be really interesting to see how courts interpret um, on demand and how far um, they take that proposition. So uh, a prominent case that you cite, of course, is the Skidmore versus Led Zeppelin. Um, are you inspired by Led, Ze Led Zeppelin by chance? Absolutely. <laughs> I figured. All right. Very good. Well, congratulations and well written. And now I'm pleased to recognize this year's winning paper written by Sophia Soferman, who attends the University of Miami Law School. Sophia, good to see you. Sophia's paper is entitled, It's My Recapture Right, and It's Now or Never. I like this uh, paper for a few reasons. I like the title, because I'm an Elvis fan, and you probably know he sang the song, It's Now or Never. I also like it because I'm an artist lawyer, and this right is a very valuable right in the career of artists, the recapture right. Your essay fortifies the idea that this right cannot be circumnavigated um, by ultimately by the um, holdings of the weight versus UMG recordings, which stands for the proposition that a loan, if transferred to a loan out company or if a loan out company enters into a recording agreement, it may extinguish the author's, the artist's right to terminate. So that's, that's powerful right there. So let's talk about what I understand is in your, in your proposition to get around the, the weight case is that, that it is um, an avenue, three avenues that can be done. And in done in the context of a corporate law analysis. So could you summarize those three avenues uh, for us? Sure. 
this paper proposes three approaches for artists to utilize in attempting to reap the benefits of their loan out company while preserving their recapture rights and hopefully affording both the artists and the recording companies greater clarity in the future. The three approaches that I outline involve corporate solutions. The first involves original authorship. The statute presumes this ability to assign authorship and ownership to an artist's loan out company. Next, it delves into equity versus employment. If an artist makes a capital contribution of their copyright, it's an entity and equity holder relationship, abrogating any work for hire arguments. Next, it discusses the notion of the capital contribution and the artist contemporaneously signing their inducement letter. This dovetails with the definition of execute within section 203, as the inducement letter is essentially a guarantee. Therefore, the use of this corporate approach acknowledges the musician signing their inducement letter simultaneously with their loan out company signing their recording agreement as putting the agreement into effect and not being put into effect until the musician performs under the agreement. Terrific. Well articulated, well written, and congratulations to you. As I presented or requested of the other writers, what was your inspiration to write this article to begin with? I was fascinated with this topic because I was reading about the current litigation in the Southern District of New York, the Wait v. UMG case. So naturally, I pulled all of the court documents on PACER, read the transcripts, started researching it, and was driven to explore how a musician's use of their loan out company to grant assignments of copyrights could potentially preclude them from recapturing their sound recordings. And there it is, and you did it. Congratulations again, Sophia. Before we leave you today, Sophia, any other remarks you'd like to make? Thank you, Mr. Abdo. I'm so grateful and humbled to have my paper recognized by the community I revere. Thank you to the Recording Academy, the attorney graders, all of the sponsors of the Entertainment Law Initiative, and the American Bar Association. Music has the power to bring us all together, to uplift, heal, and unify. It's a sacred creation that must be protected. I'd like to give my thanks to my wonderful supportive parents, Deborah and Bruce Soferman, to my insightful professor at the University of Miami, Harold Flagelman, and lastly, to the extraordinary musicians who've opened their hearts to me, leading me to understand their plights and successes. This paper and award are dedicated to all of you. Thank you, Sophia. Now moving on, I'd like to offer my personal congratulations to our 2021 Entertainment Law Initiative Award honoree, the Black Entertainment and Sports Lawyers Association. Let me turn the program back now to Lori to introduce that portion of this program. Take it away, Lori. Thank you, Ken. And congratulations to Sophia, Alberto, and Evan. For the next segment of our program, I'm very pleased on behalf of the Recording Academy and the ELI Executive Committee to join in honoring the Black Entertainment and Sports Lawyers Association, affectionately known by many as BISLA, with our 2021 Entertainment Law Initiative Service Award. This year, Beazle is celebrating its 40th anniversary, which makes it an excellent time to honor this amazing organization. Please enjoy this short video profile about Beazle. Hi, I'm Kendall Minter. I'm a practicing attorney. Um, I'm one of the co-founding directors and members of Beesla. What we were all looking to do was create a zone of comfort, a place where we could reside both mentally and physically and spiritually so that we could grow our practices, be comfortable in communicating with each other, and also excel in what we do. And as a result of that network, literally hundreds of additional lawyers and law students have been able to get employment all throughout the entertainment and the sports sectors. My name is Louise 
West. We needed an organization uh, primarily to educate younger lawyers, to encourage law students who want to enter the entertainment business. We were like, wow, the organization is really working and networking is uh, a very important part of that. BISLA uh, unlocks a lot of um, information that you don't get uh, in law school. Um, BISLA is community, BISLA is support. I'm very proud of Fordham Law's partnership with BISLA. This is the fourth year when BISLA has uh, held its mid-year conference here at Fordham and I'm really delighted that Bees was at our school and that we're working with Fordham. Sports and entertainment law is a very competitive field. It's a challenging field. Many, many people want to get into it. Many of our students want to get into it, and it's critically important that we provide the educational and networking opportunities that enable our students to succeed. Again, one of Beesla's missions is uh, to provide excellence in the entertainment and sports industries, and part of that is providing um, a pipeline uh, for young lawyers and law students um, to become great and excellent in what they do. I entered law school with a plan. I was like, I know I want to do entertainment law. I looked into organizations that I knew I had to join, and Beesla was at the top of my list. Everyone at Howard Law that did entertainment law was really interested in the organization and very involved, so I knew I definitely had to be a part of it when I started law school. When I went to the ABA conference, I met um, someone who has been a part of the board of Beesla before, and he gave me my first internship in the entertainment field at his law firm. It opened that door for me and led to several other internships in the entertainment field, and I feel like that's what gave me my break in breaking into the entertainment and media industry. Well, if you're, hypothetically, if you're a law professional and you just heard about Beesla and you're interested in pursuing a career, in the entertainment or sports industry, I would probably start off by telling you that some of the most prominent successful attorneys in that space are either members of the organization now or are pretty consistent speakers and contributors to the organization. So if you are seriously interested in pursuing a career in this field, Visa is probably the place where you want to start if you're a minority. If you were a legal professional who had not heard of Beesla, I would say, if you're looking for a place where you can meet amazing people who are talented, who are um, accomplished, who are empowering, who can help young people figure out their way, whether they're seasoned or starting in the business, then you need to come to Beesla. Well, Beesla, I mean, obviously I'm in the entertainment space. I'm African-American, so, you know, the Black Entertainment Sports Lawyers Association is critical as we look at diversity in film and TV, that you have these accomplished executives um, behind the scenes fighting for what we see in film and TV. Um, so it's in a very important organization. I'm very, um, I'm very proud that I have initiated the partnership between MPAA and Beesla. Beesla is my world, to be honest with you. Uh, since I'm a tax attorney, I'm a non-traditional entertainment attorney, but I work in the film and TV industry, and Beesla affords me the opportunity to uh, get continuing legal education, to network, to learn about the industry, things that I may not have known coming from the film finance side. Uh, Beesla is home to me. This is an organization where you can come and connect with people who are interested and involved in the same industry as yourself. But one of the most critical things about Beesla is the ability at Beesla to connect with industry leaders, top influencers, and leading professionals. The thing about Beesla that I think is maybe one of our well-kept secrets is the fact that Beesla creates such an intimate connection between its members. It gives you an opportunity to connect with people in the industry at a much deeper level than I've been in, um, or had the experience at other conferences. In addition to the quality of people that are on our board, our greater membership is just as deep and just as diverse. Uh, that's where the value is. The value is in meeting someone that you may just be sitting next to, striking up a conversation, and you realize that person is the head of an organization. 
Uh, and you may not need that person right now or that person may not be a resource right now. And that may be two or three years down the road to be able to pick up the phone and make a phone call and have that relationship. That's the value of Beesla. My name is Matthew J. Middleton and I am Beesla. My name is Khadija Sharif Drinkert and I am Beesla. My name is Shakita and I am Beesla. My name is Leron Rogers and I am Beesla. I am Beesla. And now I have the honor of introducing a special guest who will do the honors of presenting the award. Deborah Lee was the chairman and chief executive officer of BET Networks, the parent company for Black Entertainment Television from 2005 to 2018. Lee sits on the board of directors for a number of companies, including Marriott International, Burberry, AT&T, and Procter & Gamble. She also sits on the board of the Paley Center and the American Film Institute. She is a graduate of Harvard Law School and the John F. Kennedy School of Government. It's my honor to introduce Deborah Lee. Hello, everyone. And thank you so much for that kind introduction, Lori. It's my honor to be here today to present an award from the Recording Academy to Beesla, two of my favorite organizations. I started going to Beesla conferences as a young attorney in 1988. It was like I found heaven. BET was based in DC and needless to say, there were not a lot of entertainment lawyers in DC. So Beesla gave me the opportunity to meet entertainment lawyers from Los Angeles and New York. It also gave me the opportunity to learn more about the inside stuff of representing clients. BET was a small network at that time, but as BET grew over the years, we grew with Beesla. I have many fond recollections of years of, of going to Beesla conferences. Um, I learned so much professionally and made long-term friends there really lifelong friends. So I'm honored to be here today. The Recording Academy's Entertainment Law Initiative annually gives its ELI service award to an individual or organization engaged in the music industry. The award to Beesla is inscribed, and I quote, in recognition of your abiding commitment to the betterment of the entertainment community through service to others, end of quote. I am honored to present this award to Beesla's chairwoman and my former colleague at BET Networks, Khadija Sharif Tricard. Thank you, Debbie. I would like to have Louise West, one of our founders, join me in accepting this award. On behalf of the Beesla Board of Directors and our membership, it gives me great pleasure to accept this award as the chairwoman of Beesla. We are thrilled that the Recording Academy saw fit to honor us in this way and having you present this to us, Debbie, is just icing on the cake. You have been personally and professionally a strong supporter of Beesla over the years and we thank you immensely. Thank you to the Recording Academy, the ELI committee, and all of those who had a hand in selecting Beesla for this service award. Beesla just celebrated its 40th year, as you heard, and we are as committed to the mission today as our founders were in 1980. And that is to advance the excellence of black professionals through legal education, professional development, networking opportunities, and promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion in the industry. Our members are some of the most established entertainment, media, and sports executives, and they represent some of the biggest artists and performers, but they always give back to Beesla, which makes our network strong, broad, and deep. But we also cater to young and emerging professionals as well, many of whom have received Beesla scholarships or internships from throughout the Beesla network and opportunities for growth and upward mobility. So while this award is in recognition of what we have accomplished to date, we will also accept it as a reminder 
of our commitment to this mighty mission. 2020 has shown us that our purpose is more relevant than ever and that we must continue to open pathways for black professionals. So we will continue to lift as we climb. Thank you so much, Louise. As one of 25 of the original founders, thank you, Academy. This only inspires us to work harder uh, to achieve our mission. Thank you again. Congratulations again to Bizla. The honor is so well deserved and I'm very proud to participate in conferring the honor. Back to you, Harvey. Thank you for those wonderful comments, Deborah, Khadija, and Louise. And I'd like to add my personal congratulations to everyone at the Black Entertainment and Sports Lawyers Association. We're thrilled to have been able to honor your organization. Thank you for 40 years of service to your members and to our industry. My congratulations also go out to Albert, Evan, and Sophia for their scholarship wins. I hope you'll stay connected to the Recording Academy as you progress in your education and career and hope a bright future lies ahead for all of you. So next up, we've got an exciting and insightful discussion for you. I'm very proud to introduce one of the best things that the Academy did this year. In May, we welcomed her as our first ever Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer. Since then, Valicia has worked across the entire Academy to make sure we're on the right path. She's done this by spearheading a number of initiatives over the last few months, including establishing a Recording Academy partnership with The Color of Change to promote positive social change within the music industry, the creation of the Black Music Collective. Uh, she helped drive a membership campaign focused on the Black music community to bring new voting members into the Academy. She hosted an industry-wide diversity and inclusion summit and partnered in our advocacy and legislative efforts. All that to say, she is an absolute game changer. Please join me in welcoming the incredible, the inspirational, and the transformational Valicia Butterfield Jones to lead today's roundtable discussion. Valicia, take it away. Thank you, Harvey, so much for that introduction. As Harvey mentioned, my name is Valicia Butterfield Jones, and I proudly serve as the first ever Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer for the Recording Academy. It is officially Grammy Awards Week, and we saw it fit to make sure that we were having an important conversation about progress and change in the music industry from a diversity, equity, and inclusion perspective. So what you can expect this week are lots of performances, artists that are going to be recognized, but also meaningful, important dialogue. So let's get right into it. The ELI Roundtable discussion. First, joining us on the stage is Major, a Grammy-nominated singer, songwriter, and actor. Major's debut, Why I Love You, took the industry by storm and surpassed over 150 million streams on YouTube. Major is also a first-time Grammy nominee in 2018 for his follow-up single, Honest. We're also honored that Major joins us at the Recording Academy as a governor of the LA Chapter Board and as an ambassador for the Black Music Collective and the DEI Committee. Welcome, Major, to the stage. Hello. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. Of course. Next up, we have Laron Rogers. Laron is a board member and serves as the president of the Black Entertainment and Sports Lawyers Association, also known as Beesla. Laron is also a music industry attorney and partner at Fox Rothschild LLP. Laron is also a board member and chair of entertainment for the Entertainment and Sports Law Section of the State Bar of Georgia and as co-chair of the Music Industry Relations Collective for the National Museum of African American Music. Laron was named among the top music lawyers by Billboard in 2020. Welcome to the stage, Laron. Thank you, Alicia. Happy to be here. Good to see you. And last but not least, my brother, Dr. Maurice Stinnett. Dr. Mo is the head of global equity, diversity, and inclusion for Warner Music Group, spearheading the company's equity initiatives. Dr. Maurice previously served as Vice President of Diversity, Inclusion, and Culture at BSE Global, whose portfolio included the NBA's Brooklyn Nets, the WNBA's New York Liberty, and Brooklyn's Barclays Center. Stanette holds a Doctor of Education from Columbia University and a Master of Divinity from Princeton. Welcome, Dr. Maurice. Good to Hello, see you. Hello, Valicia. It's good to see you and everybody else here today. 
So I know those bios were formal, but we're gonna have a family dialogue and conversation right now about the state of the world, the state of the United States and the state of our industry. And we know behind the scenes how much work gets done and how heavy of a time it's been. And so the first question to all of you has been, how's your heart? Mm -hmm. How's your soul? And how have you been protecting your peace over the last year? Uh, Major, I would love to start with you. Well, you know, um, I guess I will start with this. This is a, a mantra that I have and a, a, a way of seeing things. I say, pace is grace. Mm -hmm. My thing is literally to allow the moment to be the moment for whatever it brings, because every moment does bring something. Um, I, I also encourage people just to embrace the shift. It's, it's important that we don't try to fight against what is happening. Just own it. You know, uh, I, I, I say lean in it, rock with it, um, trust the process because there's much seed in the ground. Um, I think a lot of times it's easy for us to be shocked by unexpected things and forget the work that was done preceding the shock. Mm -hmm. That still has to bear fruit. And so if you just give it time, knowing that it always works out in due time, I think it all, it just makes things a little easier. Um, they call me the hope dealer. So I, I just kind of flow in that space. You know me, Belisha, that's what I gotta do. And, and it's proven to serve me well. Um, there's a lot of work to be done um, in so many areas from the civil unrest to the huge divide um, that's in our country right now um, to so many isms that are plaguing us, especially in the diversity, equity and inclusion uh, uh, climate. Uh, I, I, just, I just think it's, it's time for us to breathe, assess, plan and get to work, you know? Yep. Absolutely. I am a witness. Uh, Major brings light into every meeting, every <laughs> moment, even in uh, social media comments. I, I've never right. told you that. <laughs> it's but just I, in me. Major, it's just in me. <laughs> spreading um, positive, positivity all the time. So just thank you for, for being the change um, and trusting the process was my big takeaway from what you just said. So thank Absolutely. you. Uh, Laron, how are you holding up? Over to you. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I'm gonna be just keeping 100 here. You know, in the, initially it was heavy. It was heavy for weeks. Um, not just the continuous bombardment because you know at the time we were at home, we were more dialed into news and television because it was accessible instead, instead of me being at the office and working, you're seeing this over and over and over in terms of some of the, the brutality that uh, was, was shown that we've known has been going on for, his, for a long time. So yes, it was heavy, but you know, 2020 was not the first time that you know us as Black people have seen that. Uh, I've grown up seeing you know our neighborhoods, my neighborhood specifically, being over policed. Um, so you know, this was not this was kind of a, a, a something we've I've seen and, and a number of folks have seen before, and but this time was a little bit different, right? So. This time was the first time that some of my non-white, I mean, non-black, my white colleagues essentially said, you know what, I know this is going on, but now I want to do something. And I think that's what was probably, you know, some of the most refreshing um, things to come out of this uh, terrible situation. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, so then trying to harness that energy and that newfound um, willingness to to right or wrong, I'm gonna say, just call a spade a spade, has been refreshing. And then just the trying to put pieces in place uh, as personally to do my part with a number of other folks trying to play a, a role to actively move things forward. It's exhausting. You know, we have our family, our career, and, you know, we feel a, an obligation to, you know, to much whom is given, much is expected. We feel an obligation to do our part to do something um, but, you know, just because it's tiring and it's exhausting doesn't mean that the work doesn't need to get done and that we're not going to do it. So, you know, I just want to, you know, stress to folks out there who are trying to fight this good fight, keep yourself healthy. Take some time to just keep your mentality in order because that, again, affects our community very highly. 
and professionally and otherwise, uh, you can't be good to anyone else unless you're, you're good to yourself. So let's, you know, I'm, I'm very excited about we're having the conversations though. It, it's very exciting. Lauren, thank you for uh, your honesty in that moment, because I don't know a person that hasn't had the heaviness that we've all felt this year. And I think, you know, so often we glamorize and glorify, you know, being resilient, you know, like against all odds, like team no sleep, but we know <laughs> that that balance and that like the ability to refuel um, during this time is equally, if not more important. So just thank you for that, Laron. Um, Dr. Maurice, how are you doing? And, and what has the last year meant or been for you? I think everybody has captured it quite well. I, I am just like everyone else. I've been tired, I've been exhausted, uh, frustrated, but what have I done, you asked, to protect my peace? I think what I have done is I've leaned on my faith tradition. It's been critically important for me, uh, and that is rejuvenate, re rejuvenating and life-giving. And so that's been essential. Uh, number two, outside of leaning on my faith tradition, I've been intentional about creating space for me to feel and to process what I'm feeling. And that means I went to a therapist, all right? A black man that went to a therapist uh, because uh, that is critically important. If I could do it on my own, I would have done it on my own. I couldn't, I couldn't make sense of what was nonsensical, okay? And so I needed to talk to someone. And so I was intentional about getting myself the help, the resources that I needed. In addition to my faith, I was gonna take advantage of the therapeutic uh, resources that were made available and at my disposal as well. So that's how I protected my peace, being intentional about doing those things. Yeah. Amen, yes. Belisha, yeah. like, if therapy is not a part of <laughs> your new norm, that part. Let, me, let me aggressively encourage you to embrace and welcome therapy because having that other perspective outside of your cluttered perspective or, or congested perspective is one of the best benefits of, of what humanity really is about. Sharing this space and sharing perspectives, seeking something outside of what your view allows or disallows you to see. Um, I, I, um, I wanted to make sure that while I am very much this hope dealer that I conveyed that it has been heavy, it has been heavy, that pace is grace has been the thing I had to keep telling myself, it all can't be done at once. Just because you see the problem doesn't mean that you're the one to only fix it or to, you know, to make things different. Um, I'm an empath as well as being an independent artist. We know that struggle as an independent artist is tough, it's heavy. I've had some really dope wins, but when you have a whole pandemic stopping everything, you've got to get creative. But my empathic part, it, it's like, I see problems beyond my own. So I got to respond to that. So I, I know that the guys on this panel share in that as well. We just are naturally inclined to move on behalf of others as well, but it's like, yo, that that self love is so essential to to this to this win, yeah. And Definitely. that's the thing, major, and and everyone, I think, you know, given you know a year of COVID, nearly, and then thinking about, of course, you know, the racial reckoning that happened in our nation, it reminds me of how the music industry and creators, specifically, uh, were one of the first communities and sectors to go out of work, like live shows canceled, concerts canceled, studio sessions not possible, and arguably will be one of the last to go back. Yeah. Right? And so thinking about that, I would be remiss if I did not mention Music Cares that provides mental health support to creators in need. So make sure you check out Music Cares. And then of, of course, I have to mention our sister Shanti Das and Silence the Shame who does amazing, amazing work in this area. Yes. So I wanna switch gears for a moment uh, because we've seen in Washington a transition of power uh, recently at the highest office, uh, but we've also seen in music a change of the guard. We've now seen chief diversity, equity and inclusion officers appointed at all the three major labels. Shout out to Dr. Maurice at Warner. Um, and we've seen uh, you know, moments uh, that became movements like the show must be paused. And so I'm wondering uh, from each of you, if you could choose one, and I know that's gonna be hard, uh, but one priority for you this year 
And for our industry, from a DEI perspective, what would it be? And Dr. Maurice, I'd love to start with you. Okay, thank you, Valicia. Great question. And you know, first of all, one thing that I've always felt that's important for me is to lead with my humanity and the humanity of others at the forefront of my mind. And so first of all, first and foremost, to be honest, my biggest priority for me, as I told you, was to protect my own peace, right? I can't pour from an empty cup. I needed to protect my family's peace, make sure that they were healthy and safe and sound, right? And then outside of that, once I got settled into the role, it was my job to understand leading with this, again, orientation toward humanity. It was simply to make sure that everyone at WMG Warner knew me, saw me, felt me, and felt heard by me. I think too often, so that's my priority, listening, learning, and leading in, right? I think too often as leaders, we rush into acting quickly from a place of stress and anxiety and pain, right? And we need to act swiftly, I get that, but we also need to act intentionally and thoughtfully based on the concerns, issues, and needs of the people that we serve, not just on what we want or think that's right. So my biggest priority has been listening and leaning in. Thank you for that, listening and leaning in. I always say um, you have to build with the community, not for it. That's right. Right, you have to start with listening. So thank you for that. Uh, Laron, over to you. Um, so the question was, what's our biggest priority? Yes, and, and yeah. not you know for you personally and your company or even for, for music from a sure. DEI perspective. So, you know, as, a, as an attorney that represents talent and companies in the space, you know, my first priority is to defend and, and protect my clients, right? Um, and, and that took on this year for the first time, not just helping them be protected financially, but emotionally, and then just protecting their craft in terms of being able to perform their craft. So, you know, the emotional standpoint, the conversations I've had with some clients on another level, you know, to Maurice's point, really touched home into, you know, we just need to release this, right? So some people just needed to talk stuff through and realize, are you going through this too? Oh yeah, I'm going, I'm not just, I'm not only one as a grown man, almost 50 years old who cried when I saw some of this, I need to talk this stuff through, right? So just doing that as 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 men and, 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 and specifically, but you're getting that out. And then I think one other priority has really come to light is really being intentional about the, the executives that are internal, that they need not just to have a title, but they need a budget and they need influence. And it takes lawyers, you know, like the Black Entertainment Sports Lawyers Association, we've been very intentional. We've had discussions about making sure our conversations, our energy, where we, where we place our clients, we take that into account, right? So we do business with companies that respect that we feel are, are, are supporting um, not just our singular client, but also the, the culture, you know, and they respect what we're bringing to the table. And, you know, not just to the exclusion of others, but to say, hey, no, I'm, gonna, I'm going to, you know, pay, you, pay some homage because I'm going to do business with the people that I think are doing business the right way. And it's not to the exclusion of others, but, you know, it's, it's just to plus size those that are doing it right. Major, your biggest priority. My biggest priority is to choose to celebrate the progress, to find the and identify the areas of progress. It's always progress. I think what happens is the weight of what has been and seeing it again and again is so frustrating that it doesn't allow you to embrace. No, we've actually, we've come some ways. We still have a lot of work to do, but if we refuse to celebrate the progress, and I'm talking about small and large wins, we've got to take a moment to do that because what it does is it, it reinvigorates a hope in those that are involved in the change making and it lets them know, listen, so, okay, okay. So here's some progress here. They're not, they're not, not taking these efforts for granted. I, I, I think we miss a lot, of, a, a lot of the progress. I think, you know, when we saw um, the uh, eight, eight minutes and 46 seconds of that knee on our brother's neck, a lot of us wanted to take us back to 
when Emmett Till experienced what he had experienced, but there were no cameras there. But there was no, there was no outcry by a public when they saw, saw that outside of you know, African-Americans outcrying, it, it was now a collective outcry. We saw, and so let's try to celebrate as much as we know we need more change. Let's try to amplify the progress because when you amplify the progress, it reinvigorates the hope and, and it keeps people moving and fueled to wanna do more. Such an important point, Major. I think all the time about the power of technology, mm -hmm. right? The power of the devices that are in our hands that can now humanize the tragedy, humanize the marginalization, humanize the injustices that our community has dealt with, grappled with, and experienced for years. And yeah. it makes me think about, and, and Maurice, I'd love for you to jump in on this one. What does success look like in a year? You know, and I think so many of us are doing the work. We've rolled up our sleeves. We're committed to this. Uh, but I wonder, you know, from your point of view, what does progress look like in one year or maybe even five? Um, you know, like how will we know we moved the needle yeah, and we've, done, we've started to, to make impact? Exactly right. I think that's critically, critically important, right? And success comes in multiple ways. Number one, we wanna see diverse representation. We wanna see more people that look like us in seats of power influence, right? Power and influence at the label and in the music industry across the board. But in addition to that, right? We can't just say representation, seeing these folks occupy these places and positions of power, right? That's just one phase of the transformation. Uh, there was a conversation that Martin Luther King, my fraternity brother had with Harry Balafonte toward ah. the end of his life. And he, okay. oh, 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 okay, okay, I didn't know that. Hey, wow. like, okay, okay, A5, we just had a moment in front of everybody. So, you know, it's all. <laughs> no <laughs> family <apologies>. conversation. <laughs> But, um, but yes, uh, Harry, Harry uh, said that King said to him, I, I'm afraid that I have integrated my people into a burning house. And what did he mean by that? Is saying that, right, if the systems and structures and policies have not been adjusted to actually accept, embrace, and to uphold the changes that we're making, or to value into, again, the people that we put in the positions of power, if they truly can't thrive in that, in that system because we haven't really interrogated those practices and policies that have historically kept those folks behind, then it's all for naught. So I think I see success as transforming our policies, our work culture, in addition to putting the people that have been underrepresented in those positions of power. Come on, man. I mean, woo. I, I mean, I should have known he's an alpha man. It only makes sense. But I, I mean, he's, he's talking right, Valicia. He's talking <laughs> right. Don't, it's not just about sharing the space, it's sharing the leadership, it's sharing the, the opportunity, it's sharing the, it, it's, it's that equity piece that they included, because it used to be diversity and inclusion. So we'll let you in the room, but you don't have any say. No, equity of powers, you know, and, and I think it's a beautiful thing. Right on, brother. Keep talking. And, and that's the thing, right, Major? And, and everyone, like, that's the behind the scenes that you don't see of a diversity officer. I'm literally all day crunching data, right? Like, right, right. doing data analysis. I just make it look cute, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm in the grind of analyzing every system, every policy, and figuring out is it equitable or not? And yeah. if not, how do we disrupt and dismantle it to make sure that there are equitable outcomes for everyone? That's the work. Right. And, and as a as an artist, one of the things that is so frustrating is, OK, as an indie artist and we don't know how long that'll last, you know, because God may say major. It's going to be major this year. I'll, I'll put that in the atmosphere. Major. I'll, I'll put that in the atmosphere. He knew what he did. My mama knew what she did when she named me. Um, but this is the thing. As as an indie artist and also as a black artist, there are automatic categories that you are allowed, spaces you are allowed to be in. And you can be so gifted. I was always that big fish in all of the ponds that I was in and all of the oceans at Berkeley, uh, uh, at um, HSPBA when I did the Juilliard Intensive and all these different things. And so when I, when I get to this space and now 
I was supposed to be a major label artist, but now I'm independent. I'm realizing there's a, there's, they compartmentalize, they put you in placements that you, that's where you belong. You're, you're indie and you're black. But my sound is, is inclusive of folk. It has some, some pop elements. You know, even the Recording Academy, my album, my last album was moved to the pop category. One of my songs was kept in R&B. And so it's like, it's like, but at radio, this is where majors are supposed to go. And, you know, we, because that's what's, that's what's understood, you know, as, as the way it has to be. And I think when we start, when we talk equity um, and inclusion, for as from an artist standpoint, try me in the other spaces and let the people tell you how they receive it. Don't tell me that it can't work because I know how I was brought up and it's very diverse. You, you can hear me speaking now, you can tell I have some education, you know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, and if you don't, I do. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I just think that we gotta, we, it's not, we, we got to remember that we as artists are not all just trying to be only known as R&B. I love R&B, but soul informed me, folk informed me, you know, pop music informed me. And there's so many other things that I would like to experience a little more of without just being categorized, you know? Yeah. Okay. I want to double click there because I want to make sure that I'm I'm listening and I understand from an artist's perspective how we as DEI officers and as attorneys should be showing up for artists, which should always be the number one priority, right? Mm -hmm. People yeah. over politics, artists over anything, right? Yeah. And so thinking about is what I'm hearing like stop or, or uh, avoid putting artists in a box? Please. Yes. Please. Yes. yes. Please. And, and honestly, I've been in situations, and I'm not going to name, you know, what, the particular label, um, but I've been in situations where they say, "Oh, I can, I can hear you in other formats, but, you know, it's just not. You're black. It's not un until you become the most popular thing before they really start appreciating you and accepting you over there. But my thing is, try it, mm -hmm. try it. Watch me show and prove." You know, I, I laud Warner. They work Andra, Andra they work Andra mm -hmm. in, in hot AC and in um, urban AC. They work her in both those spaces and she wins in both. Mm. And I yeah. think, go ahead, go ahead, Lauren. I was gonna say, you know, uh, as an attorney, it's something that we've dealt with because you take artists in and you're, you're starting to talk to the people who are cutting checks, right? And so the people who are cutting checks are trying to figure out how they're gonna get their money back. This is like Shark Tank, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're already trying to figure, oh, this sounds like X, so we're gonna do what we did with Y because that was successful, right? And unfortunately, that's, you know, just what Major said, that's what happens because that's where they've made, had had success is by putting a, a, a black artist in that kind of a box. Um, so I think you, you let the music speak for itself, but then it's not just on, on the artist side. It happens on the executive side as well. Or, you know, do we have, do we have a black executive over country, over rock? I mean, I know some A&Rs who have a fantastic ear in those segments, but they get pigeonholed and, and that, you know what that does? It prevents them from going up the executive ladder Yes. because they get pigeonholed into a, uh, an urban role, which is total BS, you know? Uh, our music is global. Uh, yeah. It's our culture. Uh, and it's and, and we all know good music. When you hear it, you don't know what the person looks like. You right. just know that's jamming. Yeah. And, you know, white artists, get, you know, Justin Timberlake gets to come over and play in our, our sandbox. Whereas sometimes, and, and they'll get the green light and they'll get, they'll get it. They'll, oh, yeah, 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 we can do that. Because then they'll say, the executive will say, I can sell this in two markets. I can sell this in the black market and the white market. Right. And all we're asking for is just do the flip. Let the music speak for itself. Let the, let the executives credentials speak for themselves and give them an opportunity. If they can pull in some rock and, you know, and, and that's what they do, let them excel. Because there, there are some, you know, white executives that don't know anything about our culture and our music. 
and yet they've ascended through the ranks and they depend on other folks, but we don't always get that opportunity. And so when you say equity, all we want, is, at least all I want, not what I teach my kids, is we want the equal ability, right? Some people are going to work harder than others and they should ascend to the top, but I'll be dang. Give me a chance, the same chance as anybody wow. else. I know what we're going to do. I already I'm know who's going to win that race. I already know. Come on, man. Give me a chance. That's what I was about to say. As a proud Clark Atlanta University grad, hey. I know what happens. I know what happens when I enter every space. Come on. Come on. Like we work harder. Yeah. We work smarter. We work faster. Like we know what we need to do and we get it done. And so yeah. I think that's just who we are as a community. Yeah. Too. Like all we need is an opening, a yes, yeah. and we can do the rest. Oh, wait, was that a bar? It's oh, a bar. Wait. It's a bar. Is that a bar, it's, Major? It's a bar. You can drop. <laughs> That's true. All we need is a yes, and yeah. we can do the rest. We're not asking for a handout. Yeah. Right. And, and, and the, you know, the beautiful thing is when we get the opportunity and the yes, it helps raise all boats. Right, because when we're in the room and we provide valuable input and we're given the budget and the resources to really do good, it makes the company more money. It makes the artists more money. Everybody makes more money when we're involved and we have an opportunity. That's that what I think we have to. That's the difference in that that the corporate America, who's really worried about ROI, they have to they have to answer the shareholders. I get it. I understand that, but understand that diversity helps your bottom line, and that's it I does. think those are the conversations I'm just now starting to have with some high level white executives who've become more woke and just open, not not woke, but just open to the discussion. And I show them how that will actually make them more money and they're starting to get it, but we'll see. But uh, you know, real, real quick, I'm, I'm sorry, Alicia, it got, it got me going, got, it has us, has us going. One of the things I wanna say to the artist specifically, and I know that this is something that can be uh, taken into account for anybody in any other field, but when you want it so bad, it's that's one thing. But to prepare for what you ask for, to prepare for what you pray for is essential. Because when the opportunity comes, the opportunity is not going to sit and wait around for you to get ready. It's about being ready to go when the door opens. And right now doors are opening because they're looking because it's about it's affecting bottom line when you don't have this diversity now, this representation. So when the door opens for you, please be ready because you being ready then makes more opportunity available for others who are ready to move when the do door opens for them. So I, I, I really wanna make sure we can have a, a list of demands, but if you ain't ready to deliver, you're wasting, you've wasted all of our time. That's it. And you've prevented the next person from getting an opportunity. There it is. There That's it, is. it. And there's data to back all of this up, right? Uh, st studies show that any company or organization that prioritizes DEI in their practice, like embeds it into their DNA, DNA, they have a 20% increase in re revenue, yeah. a baseline. And right, so not only does it impact your bottom line if you don't prioritize it, it improves it. Come on. Right? So the ROI truly is. Um, there's a business imperative for this beyond it being the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, so let's let's get a little bit, you know, we're getting fancy now, right? Like I think we we talked about the data, we've talked about protecting our peace, yeah. we've talked about creators and artists first. Um, now I want to talk about leadership. What does leadership really look like? Um, I'm a firm believer that, you know, tone starts at the top. And you know, there's but so much DEI officers can do unless we are truly supported by our boards, by our leadership, by the chairman or women of our organizations. Um, and I think all the time about how expansive and inclusive our work should be. To Laurent's point, you know, whenever I'm in the room, I'm looking at who else is still not at the table, right? Am I centering in this conversation creators with disabilities? Am I centering in this com conversation the Latinx community? Am I centering in this community in this conversation LGBTQIA rights and equity? And so my question to you is, what can a leader who's watching, meaning the CEO of an organization who may be watching this conversation, what should be the number one thing on their radar in 2021 from a DEI perspective? And Lauren, I would love for you to kick us off. Sure. 
I, I think they should identify um, several key people who are diverse, who they can who they can put in power uh, positions of power, and just or as a sounding board, so that in all the senior decisions that are made, that they take the perspective that you know what's good and what's diverse and what's equitable um, into into account. And I think sometimes executives who are you know monovoiced, right? Everyone at the table sounds and looks the same. They don't even consider. I think it's it's an unconscious bias, right? And so until you have uh, allow very smart people, and it's it's important to get smart people, really good people. You know, make sure that they're they're the right good people and respected, um, because we want the right input, right? As as diverse people um, in, 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 that are making those kinds of recommendations to senior leadership, and when and when that happens. You don't have the gaff of a of an advertising campaign, you know, you, because someone says, mm, "I don't think that's going to work." That 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 may be perceived a certain way, and so just put those people in the room so that they can provide input at a high level, so that the policies from top down get implemented with that in place. Because when a lot of times what happens is it works backwards, the policies get sent down and then the you know the diversity and equity inclusion person is trying to figure out how to put a, uh, a square peg in a round hole and or working you know to play catch up but if you have those conversations on the front end then your your organization not your, your not just your diverse employees but all your employees will feel more dialed in and 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 more and buy in and then you're like like you said Valicia they'll make more money which is at the end of the day I understand it's about Hitting quarterly reports, um, making your shareholders happy, getting your your bonuses. We understand that, and we're trying to help help. Let us help you make more money, right? And that I think that's what we're saying that we can do if you let us in. Let us in the game, Coach. Tag us in. All right, Dr. Maurice. I think for me, the word, if I were speaking to an executive that was watching us today, I would say accountability. True leadership is synonymous with accountability. We're always accountable to something and someone. And what I mean by that is accountable to really driving this DEI initiative and agenda throughout your enterprise. If it cannot be measured, you're not going to be able to manage it. And so you need to be accountable to creating the right metrics around DEI initiatives that you can measure, that you're transparent, that you're accountable to your stakeholders, you're accountable to your artists, that you are leading with accountability around DEI initiatives. And I think that's the key takeaway. And that's what's going to set apart those who truly are about the work and leadership and those who are about window dressing. And so if we're accountable and transparent and leading from that place of accountability, and again, management and matrix and measurement, et cetera, I think that's what we're gonna see a uh, true progress from leaders. So I couldn't agree with you more. Accountability is key. And, and I say all the time, hold me accountable too, <laughs> right? If I'm not doing my job. <laughs> Well, we already know what's going to happen if you're not doing your job. Exactly. <laughs> you're not going to right. get demoted up like some others. Right. We don't fail up. <laughs> right. Um, um, but 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 it's true. And, and I think, you know, that's the beauty of having people who really care in these offices and in these seats. Like, you know, I say to my brother, Dr. Maurice, all the time, like, you know, tap me on the shoulder if I'm getting it right and tap me if I'm getting it wrong, you know, because I care enough to take myself out of it and, and to say to myself, you know, is the work being done because our community needs it, right? Bigger than, you know, any of us need, you know, a title, right? More importantly, are we really making progress for our community? And so, um, you know, we said from the beginning, artists first. And so, you know, we're gonna have a grand opening and a grand closing here in this conversation ah. um, with Major, who I would love uh, for you to share for any leader as you are also, for any CEO or chairman of a board um, watching from an artist's perspective, uh, what would be the one thing that you'd love to leave with them? I have a song that says it's called Better With You In It. And uh, the lyrics uh, start with, to be loved, it's not a given, should be cherished like a ribbon in the sky taking flight on a ride where it won't come down. But if you see, like I see, you will realize it's more than a dream. 
that we're awakened and overtaken by the scene. My life is better with you in it. Make room for more than what you bring. Make room. The beauty of humanity, the beauty of this life that we live is that there are spaces to be shared. The sky is big because more than one bird can fly. There's room for that. Trends are great. Trends are effective. However, trends fade. And as trends fade, the money will fade with it. Take chances. Take chances on new things, different things, on major things. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's, it's, that, it's that empathy. I always encourage empathy. Empathy comes first by listening, considering, seeing, and choosing to have a conversation that will provide you new insight on what you may know, what you need to know, and or what you have missed. If you open yourself up to that space, I promise you, your institution will be more beautiful. This is for the artist. This is for the executive. This is for the ambassadors. This is for humanity. Please make room. This world is better with you in it. And you know I got to plug it with, this is why I love you. Yeah, baby. <laughs> oh, I had the honor of seeing you perform it live um, mm -hmm. at a good friend's wedding years ago. And that song and you, um, again, just light up every single room. And so it has been an honor. And that song has paid a lot of bills. Okay. <laughs> I, can get, I can get a large at Chick-fil-A because of that song. Let me get $5. <laughs> right. oh, it has been an honor to host this conversation seriously yeah. um, I cannot say enough uh, how uh, I don't take for a second for granted that during um, my first my personal first Grammy Awards week I've had the honor of hosting this conversation with each of you and make no mistake it's also Women's History Month and so um, thank you for your time thank you for your talent Thank you for your leadership. Um, and, you know, let's get to work. Uh, I know this is will be, you know, one of many conversations that we'll have, but I'm more excited about the impact that we're going to drive together. So thank you so much. Thank you to the Recording Academy. Thank you to ELI. And now without further ado, we are going to turn it over to Lori Soriano. Bye, guys. Thanks again, Valicia. And thanks again to all our roundtable discussion participants. While many of us wish we could be departing this event to go and get re ready for a wonderful Music Harris Person of the Year tonight, we won't be able to celebrate that way this year. Instead, Music Harris is hosting a virtual event this evening. I would encourage you to give to Music Harris in support of the many less fortunate in our music community, the thousands who have been out of work and struggling this year. Visit musicharris.org to donate or find out more about their virtual Grammy Week offerings. So we've come to the end of our program, but I do ask you to stick around for a moment longer as we thank all of our supporters of this event, which you'll see displayed on our screen in a moment. Thanks again for taking time to join us today. Congratulations again to Beesla and to our student scholarship winners. We'll see you all next year. Thank you.